This is Jesse. This is Sean. And welcome to GenderCast, our trans masculine gender query. Join us as we discuss our journey through gender expression, trans masculine culture, identity, and navigating the binary in our communities. Welcome to GenderCast, episode 39. Wow, 39 episodes. Sean and I are back in the same physical location. Say hi, Sean. Hello. <laughs> I feel like we haven't recorded together in a while. It's been a while. And we're down to our one every three to four week episodes as well. So we hope that you enjoyed all of the Philly interviews. It was amazing getting to talk to everybody there. And um, the topic for today's episode is navigating queerness, relationships, radicalness, and reconciling. And we'll talk a little bit about what that is. But what it actually is, is a laundry list smorgasbord of a lot of different topics that have been floating around in both of our minds and that we've noticed happening in community and noticed happening sort of going on around Facebook and different blog posts that folks are sharing, especially after marriage passing in Washington and different more mainstream things happening and also kind of thinking about the workshop I did at Philly. So yeah, we're going to go through sort of a laundry list of topics that we've been thinking about. And before we do that, Sean's going to talk a little bit about next steps. Yes, the next steps. So as Jesse kind of already said, this episode is kind of a, a look forward, if you will, like a, a planning day along with you guys in regards to kind of what happens as far as topics go this next year. Typically with summer, we have a, a bit more time to kind of discuss and think about what does the next year or so look like in terms of what we want to kind of have happen or what we want to talk about. So we will be setting up a poll and today we're gonna to introduce several different topics and you know have a little bit of an elevator speech for all of them or at least a small discussion. But these would be topics that we'd go further into research and then start to look for guests and people to have on that would broaden the conversations around what we hit on quickly today. And then the other thing that we wanted to really introduce is that we've been doing this for two and a half years and we are looking for at this point some fresh ideas and fresh voices. Jesse and I, while in some ways very different as far as um, identities and positionality, we are also very similar in the sense that we live in the same geographical area. We're fairly around the same age. We even studied similar coursework in college. We're both white and we both identify as trans. Anyways, so we are looking to kind of broaden the conversation we have on GenderCast. And so what we've been talking about for several months now is what would it look like to have folks be able to have conversations with their communities and their friends and kind of, you know, be housed under GenderCast in the sense that we've already got the infrastructure set up. And so we would just be featuring and kind of showcasing whatever conversations you guys want to have. And so we have a PDF kind of the quick and dirty of podcasting. It can be as simple and cheap as, you know, a $19 headset with a mic from Radio Shack or even with internet accessibility, it can be something that would be done over like Gchat or something like that with video. So for those of you out there that are interested, we would definitely like to hear your thoughts or your ideas about maybe something that you guys would want to talk about and we would just feature. The other thing that we're looking to do uh, is, as you've heard the last few episodes, we've been kind of alternating between, you know, more famous slash celebrity folks within our community that make music like Ray Spoon or we've done J.D. Sampson in the past or Ivan Coyote. We've also had Gavin's music on, um, someone we know from Canada. So if other folks of you play music out there and would want to kind of have your music housed in the small breakpoints or either the intro and extra of the episode, you could send us an MP3 or CD and we'll attach your name and give you credit for it and stuff like that. Um, but try to get some, you know, community music kind of circling through our episodes and breaks, which is kind of where we're, we're looking to go. And the last thing I will say <laughs> is that we're also in thinking kind of about our time and what do we love about this project and what tends to be a little more tedious and sometimes take away from that joy of being on the mic. And one of those things is uh, editing. And so I think what we're at least going to try out for a couple episodes is to really have a more natural, flowing, less editing heavy type of show in the sense of uh, when we first started, we'd edit out our ums and edit out idiosyncrasies uh, when we have guests come on and, and talk. So we are going to try to experiment with getting away from that for a little bit and 
editing for content if we need to, but just have more of a free flowing. There'll be more pauses, more laughs, more just, you know, what we would typically edit out, edit out. So it's almost like now you will be a part of our conversation in particular, like you were here in the room because we're not editing. Um, so that's what we're going to kind of try out. So with that said, we'll get started with this episode. And the first point uh, I'll let Jesse introduce um, and we'll kind of just go down the list. So the first thing that we talked about in terms of our laundry list was assimilation and homo normativity. So if you'll think back to the interview that we did with Matilda, um, she was actually talking about her book that had just come out at that time, which is Why Are Faggots So Afraid of Faggots? And we talked, and it was before marriage equality actually passed in Washington, so we were talking a lot about why she doesn't support gay marriage and how it's actually harmful. And she actually talked a bit about um, the military industrial complex as well. And so a couple of things that have happened since that episode is don't ask, don't tell have been repealed and marriage equality has passed in Washington. And then of course, as you all know, DOMA was taken down. Um, so the federal government has gotten involved. So I guess as we were thinking about our laundry list, I was thinking of that as a jumping off place the stuff that uh, Matilda was talking about in terms of, I guess the first thing that I'll say that's the most problematic for me is all the resource and, and dollars that have been directed towards lobbying for marriage equality in terms of the work that HRC has done. And I know that on our GenderCast page, we've posted a lot of sort of critical analysis of HRC and we're basically up into the billions of dollars that have been spent on promoting marriage equality. And so as I'm thinking about all of that money that was spent on sort of advertising and promoting and lobbying, what could we have done with that billion dollars that might have more well-served queer and trans people? Do you want to weigh in on that? I want to back up and say that, again, from our position, we are two individuals, but we also have a platform, right? So I'm sure a lot of audience folks out there found it useful to be married, and maybe that helps you share insurance. Maybe that helps you navigate your family situations and the legalities that may come with children or property or whatever. And we're not saying that that isn't useful and, you know, that that can't be something extended to everyone, but that those things themselves are coming from an area of non-survival in the sense of folks that don't have health care to share, folks that don't have property to worry about. What do non-traditional families look like and how do we reward or um, punish folks that are breaking out of that lines. And I think that the other conversation that just wasn't had was like, how does this impact folks of color and low income folks that are going to be more marginalized already? Uh, and moving forward, this isn't going to help. This is not helping that. So there was a lot of, you know, articles right after this got passed that said, okay, now that's done. So can we move on? There's been, you know, so much of that. And the conversation that was not had or that was a big fail in my eyes was around race here in Washington. In particular, you looked at all of the the pro-marriage ads, and they were all white middle-class families, if not upper-class, that were talking about how, you know, they wanted their daughter or son to have the same kind of life with a, you know, long-lasting partner and all of this stuff, uh, but it also never featured anybody that was a person of color. And how often does the larger gay mainstream really equate gay with whiteness? So there's a lot of conversation within that kind of campaign, not just to what ends, but also all of its strategy in between. I had friends and classmates that went and phone banked and what they were kind of um, conditioned to say as to not say was really interesting in regards to like, who are you calling? Who are you winning support for? And who are you doing this on behalf? And I would say across the entire LGBTQ population, you'd have more folks in one area in, sense, in the sense of identity of around white, middle class, educated, you know, and the list goes on with the, you know, privilege as to like whose concern that was. You know what I'm saying? So I guess that that's the conversation we would have in a little more depth. And I guess the other thing to kind of go off of what you were saying that this, that marriage is useful for some people. I think the thing that has been difficult for me in having conversations about it is 
people feeling like I'm personally attacking them or people feel like they're individualizing because they want to get married or because it benefits their family. And I think I have no personal attack against individuals like that's I don't want to spend my time and energy doing that and, and bring harm to people in that way. What I want to attack are the structures and the institutions. And so when I when I say I'm not supporting marriage equality, I'm not saying you're a bad person because you're getting married. I'm saying the actual structure of marriage is based on a patriarchal, sexist, oppressive, capitalistic system that provides access and resource to people that already have access and resources. People that already benefit from the way that the system is set up then benefit from marriage because marriage is part of a fundamentally flawed system. And so I think that that's where a lot of people get hung up because it becomes this like individual conversation when it's actually like, no, I'm not attacking individuals, I'm attacking institutions. There are a, a lot of individuals that stand to benefit from those institutions that I wish would pause and have some more critical analysis about what it is when they're getting theirs, when people that already have a lot of access to resources are getting theirs by getting married, who who else is like standing to lose? Who else is not getting their needs met? And, I, and when I say needs, I'm actually talking about really basic needs met. And I think for me, it's three top things that those resources could have gone towards. I think queer and trans youth, specifically queer and trans homeless youth, um, poor youth, uh, youth of color that don't have access to getting their basic needs met, healthcare, healthcare for everybody that don't already have access to healthcare, whether you're queer and trans or not. And then a caveat to that, trans-specific healthcare, and then something with our fucked up immigration system. Definitely the prison industrial complex. I think that that's something that we are going to constantly be putting resources in and it's such a broad category to me when i think about the prison industrial complex but three things that that billion dollars could have gone to in terms of like basic need stuff right now that's like super simple to have like here's three bullet points in a conversation so i guess marriage is just one example of assimilation and, and homonormativity i think the thing that I think about a lot and what marriage promotes is sort of that just like us kind of idea that we're all sort of going towards this sort of ideal way of being like an American or ideal way of being like in the world. And I feel like the lesbian and gay movement as as different, when I say lesbian and gay movement, I'm saying that as different from the queer and trans movement is sort of promoting us to assimilate into all the industrial complexes and all the harmful systems that queer and trans people are actually trying to dismantle. So like Matilda said, it actually is like causing more harm because it's promoting people to subscribe more to a system that's fundamentally flawed and harmful to people, whether that's through marriage or joining the military or being an arm in the prison industrial complex. Yes, and I would agree with that. I think that when when you said earlier ideal, like that ideal way and what assimilation is, I think about successful. We all want to be successful. What does that mean? We have decent jobs that will provide health care and that will get our basic needs of shelter, food, and those resources met. So to be successful, we need to look like the mainstream. So that's what we're busy doing. And assimilation isn't just about your decisions on necessarily marriage or the military. I think the military is a good example of how, again, if you're in the military already, is it that we think that – LGBTQ identified folks shouldn't be able to get the same benefits for their partners at home or treatment in the military or have access? No, but what we believe, um, and I, I feel comfortable saying we in this particular moment, that the actual idea of the military or militarism is not within our value system. So while we would like everyone to be equal in that way of access, we don't want that to exist altogether. I mean, if you look at militarism in the sense of the motivation behind it is capitalism, which promotes global inequities and poverty. You look at imperialism, you look at racism and where are we going and who is doing the fighting and how does that work and how is even – you know, the targeting of where in America does the military seek its recruits, like all of these things are part of the conversation. It's not just, does this one person deserve this or that? And I think that, you know, we talked even about, we here in Seattle have to our accredit of lovely performance artist Macklemore. And there was this great article written by um, Hell, who we had on for our disability justice episode that really 
broke that down and was like basically asking the question, why does it take a white cis straight guy to publicize this to America? Because Macklemore looks more like everyone else in the mainstream and embodies more of those positionalities, his platform of using hip hop music and talking about social justice issues that are not his own. So like, why does it take that performer versus all of the like queer hop that have been talking about this stuff for so long, but no one knows of them? I just wanted to add, I've had some conversations with folks about Macklemore and I think a lot of people think that he is being this great ally and standing in solidarity with basically with lesbian and gay folks. And I think the my pushback to that is although it does seem that way and what he's saying and, and the message that he's delivering, the fact that he's delivering the message and that he's one co-opting a, a form of art, I guess, as you'll say it, or a genre of art in, in terms of using hip hop as his medium and then conveying the message through same love about it being okay for gay people to get married as a white person. He's actually profiting from that. He's taking something that affects a group that he doesn't participate in. And then he's getting millions of dollars and selling records by talking about it. And that's how it's like tied to capitalism is because he's co-opting the message and then he's profiting from a message that isn't even his message. And then people are like, yeah, but then it's getting the message out there to all these people that listen to his music. But really in the long run, like, what does that say? That's saying, oh, we need a straight cis white dude. And I think that that's different than like white folks that do anti-racist organizing because they're actually in the communities, they're organizing, they're having conversations and they're not profiting from it. So I do think that there's really like beneficial, amazing ways to stand in solidarity and be allies. I don't think it's done by selling records. And I mean, outside of just like whatever financial return he got and whether or not he gave that away, I don't, we don't know. I don't know what he did with his money, but it's also like a social capital, right? Like he is forever kind of catapulted based on like really championing this issue into kind of like a celebrity and will forevermore have better access to finances to opportunities to play shows and all of these things and again not saying that there's not great intention there i guess the bigger question is how do all the other forms of hierarchies of oppression play out in queer places like why is it still really white why is it still really cis why is it still really male if you were to think about all of the gay stuff you've seen in the last 10 years in the sense of like lgbtq stuff like posters or music or movies or whatever and like what issues are being shown and what is non queer America seen about queer folks? I think fundamentally for me, what separates sort of the LNG, the lesbian and gay is that they're subscribing to all of the isms and sort of like indoctrinating them as part of their movement. And when I think about queer and trans movement, and I think it also is reflected in like the topics that we've even talked about in the podcast. To me, like the queer and trans movement is more about like being anti-racist, having analysis around class privilege, ha having analysis around disability and a disability justice movement, having analysis around sexism and misogyny and how that play and how that plays out, having analysis around capitalism, having analysis around the industrial complexes. It's not just about being a trans person in the world. I really do think that like this whole idea of like what a queer and trans politic is, is to, to sort of resist and push back and try to think about imagining ways of dismantling all of those systems that if you look at the lesbian and gay movement and you look at equality are actually subscribing to. And so it's becoming a much brighter line to me. And I actually, when I look at like who I have common political ideas around, it's not necessarily people across the LGBT umbrella. I actually have a lot of straight, cis, however, you know, non-LGBT identified people that I actually share more of a political analysis with because of all of the kind of anti-racist beliefs that we have and having analysis around language and class and access and all the things that sort of like draw these bright lines in our culture, at least in American culture, between the haves and the have-nots. So as you can see in true gender cast fashion, we've just briefly hit on that <laughs> 20 minutes in. <laughs> um, so let's, I, I think listeners out there probably get the idea of where we're going. Um, and so we would do some research and bring some, you know, fairly good debate to that conversation. And other few bullet points we have that are kind of in this same vein 
um, which I kind of touched on is how do isms play out in queer spaces? Um, and we could bring in someone to talk about that because I think there's been some really awesome research to show that even in our Q centers on college campuses, these ideas of racism, sexism, like they still play out in this very, you know, internalized way. The other thing we want to also mention, and I know that we talk about uh, media because we are a media outlet, but how much mainstream media affects and is such a huge tool of capitalism. Um, I feel like the media industrial complex, it's kind of not even its own complex because it's such a tool of all the other complexes. It's a huge tool of the prison industrial complex, the military industrial complex, the medical industrial complex, and really is a way that these ideal states or these capitalist ideal states of, of heteronormativity, cisnormativity, um, certain ways bodies should look and be, how ideas of femininity and masculinity are portrayed sort of in social media, on the TV, when you look at a magazine, when you watch movies, um, and then we're sold all these products and all these things that we're supposed to want to make us achieve that ideal state or have that perfect house or buy that car over there and then I'll, be, I'll look like that guy and have access to these things that he has. And we're just sort of brainwashed from a very, very young age. And I my heart hurts when I see these kids just like glued into their, their now with the iPads and all the, the tablet are so popular now. And I was sitting in a park the other day and this kid was playing on an iPad and just like glued to it. And, um, I've been doing a little bit of traveling lately and watching on the airplane. It's like they're interacting with this iPad and not like other human beings. Anyway, that's a whole nother conversation, but the media is such a huge sort of brainwashing that happens to us and then if we don't have sort of like a critique or an analysis of what's happening i think like orange orange is the new black is a is a really good example for those of you that haven't heard of it or watched it you're living under a rock probably <laughs> because it's all over but it's the new netflix show and going into that show with having an analysis around race having an analysis around the prison industrial complex having an analysis around class and access to information and sort of how all this stuff is playing out in this show what's made that show really valuable for me is not just the fact that it exists but all of this sort of feedback that's happening around it and all this critique that's happening that's that's what's made me actually want to watch it is so i can sort of be part of that conversation of critiquing it and saying this is what's wrong with it or this is something that was done well so i think that the thing about the media that is so lost is that people just sort of consume it they eat it without really thinking about what they're eating they just take it in and I don't mean they, I, I, I don't mean to sound like oppressive and like they as in like these evil people. I think we all just take it in. I take it in and forget to have analysis about it. And there's so much out there. It's just like everywhere. You can't get away from it. That's because there's, there's only seven types of stereo in the sense of <laughs> seven folks that control everything we see, hear, or read. Um, and our next bullet point is living under capitalism, which is a direct relation. Um, you know, as Jesse was talking about messaging and how that plays into what we consume, but also how we see people, who we're taught to fear, who we're taught to feel better than and or more educated than or more valuable than. All of these things are crucial. And, you know, like we could certainly do some stuff around certain times in history where there was specific media campaigns to really create divisions among poor people around race or I'm sure right even now, like looking at the uh, LGBTQ and the like assimilatory mainstream versus not, like what is that? What is the value in that? Who, why is that happening and who's marketing that stuff to us? So there's all of that stuff, um, which, you know, again, living under capitalism, the guise of how this system really, you know, is survival of the fittest and the fittest is the one with the most cash and what do we have to do to have it and who do we have to hurt to take it? Um, in this like large way of everything from like an emotional sense to like again how we see ourselves to what's happening across the globe all of these large things that spurn so many things that we feel are are not working for people like prisons like war healthcare that's inaffordable so all of these things um so right now we're going to go into a break so that's kind of our our topic around assimilation and homonormativity and what's happening with that and some ideas the next little section will be debunking trans 101 and being on gender identity panels uh next after the break fire burns like ice is cold people walk to what they're told i'm just a girl or so they say but they Stop. 
Thanks, Gavin. The next thing that we wanted to talk about was uh, being on Trans 101 panels. And I feel like, you know, the transgender movement or the queer and trans movement or, or however you want to sort of talk about the idea of bringing in the conversation of gender to sort of a broader LGBT conversation. And I feel like I would say I've noticed in the last, you know, five or so years that there has been more of a focus on wanting to learn about gender. Um, I know that like for my work, when we do like our pride month, the last couple years, the conversation has lent itself more towards understanding like transgender. So what that means is a lot of us get asked to be on what I'll call like gender identity panels or trans 101 panels, or can you please come talk about your trans experience panel? And I just want to spend like a couple minutes on the podcast talking about that because it's something I've been thinking about a lot, like how harmful it is for us to go and give like our personal narratives about our bodies and our choice and our choices around engaging with medical interventions and why I think it's really a vulnerable place and a harmful place to have to talk about those sorts of things. And I know that people think that telling your personal story is a really powerful way to like win allies and like win people over. And I think in the right setting and in the right sort of circumstance, having personal conversations about that stuff, everyone can do that however they want. But I think in a really public way, it's very sensational and difficult and harmful to trans people to go in front, in front of a group of people they don't know and talk about their genitalia, talk about whether or not they've had top surgery, to talk about whether or not they take hormones. And I feel like it offers this like microscope or spotlight on us in a way that's very sort of othering and actually not humanizing at all. I actually think it's really dehumanizing. And I know a lot of people share this belief and I've actually learned a lot from Seattle community and, and people around here that have talked about this. I actually would offer that there's a different way to talk about gender in terms of talking about gender conformity in the world, talking about all the things that Sean and I just talked about, talking about capitalism, talking about the industrial complexes, talking about how there's this sort of cis, hetero, white sort of ideal state that we see when we engage with the media and that anybody that sort of doesn't meet that ideal is, is other and trans people are sort of part of that whole othering that happens. I have a little worksheet that I worked up with a friend of mine when we did a panel about a month and a half ago, and we sort of framed it in three ways. And I'm just going to read the frames and then I'll hand it off to you to kind of weigh in. So this is sort of like my, my foundation for around gender identity panels. So the goal of our panel was honoring gender ambiguity and in individuals' agency and self-determination and gender expression, understanding the systems that are set up to create ideals or norms that hurt us all. It's kind of like the whole idea that racism hurts white people, racism hurts everybody. I think transphobia and gender conformity hurts everybody, not just trans people. So the three frames are not providing your own personal trans narrative, giving definitions and talking about language that is problematic, and providing a systemic context for transphobia. And sort of in all of that, connecting to other struggles. So talking about sexism, talking about racism, talking about classism, um, talking about ableism. If you want to know more about this, shoot us an email at GenderCast. It's actually something I would love to hear from listeners, talk about how you, what you do on panels. And I also just want to give like one final thing. I think when people ask those inappropriate questions about genitalia and, and about how you engage sort of in a personal way, that those should be shot down. I don't think that they should be answered. Well, I don't know. Remember when we did? So we are going to have one of our discussions on air. We usually have our, our story straight before we start. But as we're just throwing stuff up there, for me, there's value on having some basics to work from because I think about right now I'm doing a practicum with the Race and Social Justice Initiative with the city of Seattle. And what, what are we doing? We're doing basic 101s about racism. I mean, racism has been happening for a bazillion years and we're still having to have these 101 conversations with white people about, wait, did you understand how even if you didn't mean to, the fact that all of the managers are white in this whole department 
probably something's happening there, right? Like it's it's beyond the individual. And I think that sometimes it's valuable to have the basics and point out structures and things for people so that they can get into the conversation. I mean, if if it was merely a matter of like, if people are just inundated with this word or this topic, they'll just get it, then we wouldn't be having the conversation about racism, in my opinion. We'd be like to the next step. But I think what I find problematic about the whole giving your narrative not only is like what Jesse has already said, kind of like the idea of like trying to speak for a whole community, which I think is always difficult and hard, and I don't think it wins any allies. I think that for me, the bigger issue is what it, what's the ask? You know, like, okay, so here I am telling you my story about what it was like for me growing up or how difficult it is for me to like get healthcare or what do I navigate? And you sit here and listen to me, uh, you know, and can relate and feel like, oh, that's so, that's hard. I want to do something, maybe, you know, like, what is it? So you you heard my story and you move on and now you know about trans stuff, which isn't true. <laughs> so what does it look like to actually have an ask? It's like, okay, so now that we've had this conversation, what are you going to do in your department? What conversations do you feel like you be able to be an advocate or an ally for? You know what I'm saying? Like, what is the point? What is the point or the vision of having panels? Like, what are they supposed to do and are they doing them? Which I don't believe they are. So how can we move away from that and move on to an action? Yeah, I think that that's actually a really good example because when we did this panel, instead of us talking about our narratives and giving this little tiny glimpse into one trans person, what we, the conversation that we had is we actually encouraged the people that came to the panel to have their own narrative, to have their own analysis around how they've engaged with their own gender. So when we talked about these ideal states, we asked them, what do you think these ideal states are? What did you learn from them? And what do they mean for your own gender identity? That whether you're cis or straight or whatever, we all have a gender identity. And how is all of these messages that you've taken in affected yours? Because then it's a more structural conversation about gender normative norms or gender sort of narratives that have been fed to us as, as we've grown up. Those affect all of us. How we engage with those might change. But I think when people have that personal relationship to the structures that they are living under, then they can be thinking about how that's harmful to everybody, especially, of course, it's more harmful to trans people because we're like so, in a lot of cases, so visibly and so like overwhelmingly like resisting that and doing something really different. But I think it opens up so much bigger of a conversation than my name's Jesse and um, I'm two years on testosterone and I haven't had top surgery. But I also feel like if I want to tell people that, especially like we have talked about that on the podcast and I was consensual. I had, I was practicing my own agency. I had self-determination around it. We had agreements that we were going to share that with our listeners in a way where we wanted people to engage with us and our stories as a way to connect with us as individuals. That's, that's so different to me than being on a panel where I'm being asked, I don't know who my audience is. I, I don't really know what's going on. I don't, it doesn't actually feel that consensual to me, especially when like we controlled the conversation. But if people ask me a question, if I'm on a panel and people are like, well, are you on hormones? Like other than just saying, I'm not going to answer that. Like just putting me on the spot in a really vulnerable way. It just feels really yucky and gross to me. So Coming up next, we're going to talk a little bit about relationships and a couple of the other bullet points. I can't believe we're already 40 minutes into this. <laughs> so we're going to hear a little bit more from Gavin, and then we're going to talk a little bit about relationships. I am born into the body of a girl. I am just one into this world. But what the world might see isn't always me. Cause inside is a boy trying to break free. body or my soul he just wants to share this body make me whole cause the girl this world does see is only half of me so for the next bullet point we're going to move on to relationships how do we talk to people we love that don't share our analysis and are not growing with us what does that look like and this i feel like it can be true and hold true uh, in a number of ways, whether it's, you know, your growing analysis of privilege and oppression or social justice or how you're coming into your gender and trying to, you know, bring your family and loved ones along 
um, and, you know, have conversations, but what does it look like to continue to care and support a relationship when the relationship is, I love you anyways, or I love you still, you know, like, despite the fact that we can't have that conversation. Um, so an episode like this would be more about our personal experiences, navigating, you know, folks we've known for a long time, but as we grow, we have found that we have less and less to talk about in the sense of how we see the world. Um, so outside of our personal connection, kind of how we maneuver things and see things are just quite different. So that would be kind of what that would look like in this way. I just will add, I think also the other thing that is, is difficult is sort of navigating relationships that you don't have a lot of control over choosing to be around, like work relationships and colleague relationships. I'm just finding like, sometimes it's just easier to not say anything and just know like I'm kind of having my bubble about me. Um, one of my friends pointed out I'm having an intense relationship with language right now <laughs> and having just a lot of like criti critical thought around the language that I'm using and the language out there. My most recent um, sort of intense thinking was around the word bitch and just sort of thinking about how people use it and what it means when they use it and who's using it and when they're using it and actually posted a couple, I found a couple of really good articles, sort of a feminist critique of it. Um, so I think that's the kind of thing that we're talking about is just like how that stuff changes and then people are using, like with language, people are still using these words and you're having like this internal thing like go off and it's like, it's, it's like, a, it's like hard to be around. It's not relaxing. <laughs> it's kind of stressful to be around and what that looks like. The next thing that we wanted to talk about was shifting dating paradigms is your sort of gender, gender identity, gender expression, gender, like gender perception changes, like how people are perceiving you changes. And I know that we've talked a little bit about attraction in the masculinity episode, the what is masculinity anyway episode, who a lot of you seem to like because it has a lot of downloads and we had some feedback at the conference that people liked that episode. Do you want to say anything about shifting attractions? I'm not sure what we would do for resources for this episode. I think we talk about our personal experiences. I know that Sam Berliner, who helped with the organize and directed the Trans Film Festival and also had the Gender Busters uh, film to his credit that showed last year and is in San Francisco, I think that he just did something that was like dating sucks or something like that. And I think that we would talk about like dating and how to navigate new settings, you know, when when people perceive your gender to be shifting and then where do you belong? How do you start that conversation? When do you tell someone what, you know, like the whole classic, like, are you obligated to tell and when, and how does that work? And how does like moving in straight heterosexual environments differ from queer or gay identified environments? You know, what does that look like and, and where's your place in it? So that would be kind of what that looks like. And I'm sure we could talk for hours on that too. Okay. Just a quick add. I think the other thing that I would, add is just like how your internal idea of attraction shifts too because I think as I'm finding myself attracted to different people like my whole internal idea of like how relationships work works is being challenged and I'm finding myself a little like frozen and like not knowing what to do it's just it's if it changes. it's confusing yeah if it changes it can be confusing but if it doesn't change if who you're attracted to doesn't change but how the world is interacting with you changes because of your expression and how you're being perceived. It's just confusing. It's confusing. I, and I know we've talked That's about it before. <laughs> it's something that I've been thinking about a lot and I guess trying to have more analysis around is femphobia and thinking about how femphobia plays out in queer circles. And I think also trans misogyny, but right now I'm thinking more about femphobia and just sort of like how as masculine people, especially as being perceived more and more masculine. I think being perceived as like a gender queer kind of leaning masculine androgynous person is really different than being perceived as like a more masculine, maybe even being perceived as male type person and how that plays out when you're bumping up against femme identified people and internalized stuff plays out and also like the structures and how for those of you that have seen the new Robin Thicke video, the blurring lines video, and then there's been at least two sort of responses to that video, but like sexism, misogyny is alive and well, and that video gets into some really risky, dangerous territory around consent too, but it's so structural, especially like the way that it comes out in the media that I think 
it's something that I want to even be more and more careful about because not only are we not wanting to be femphobic, but we're also wanting to push back about uh, around the larger sort of sexist, misogynist, femphobic structures that are at play. And that's overwhelming at times to, to think about and think about how to resist. Okay, so the next thing we have listed is queer versus LGBT. I think we already covered that. Um, I just want to sort of call out that I think there's so many different twists and turns of that that one could take on. So I feel like that that's an interesting topic that will be never ending. Well, kind of like assimilation versus anti-assimilation really is what it boils down to. Or what is queer? I mean, I feel like the queer politics versus queer identity in the sense of self has been really different. I've definitely had a few folks that are straight identified ask me if they could use queer based on their political stance. So we'd probably do some research and have conversations around what is queerness, what's its history, and then what does it look like in, in modern day as opposed to before in, in sense of politics and identity. Yeah, and just what it means to queer something, really. Yeah. Coming up next, we're going to talk a little bit about the last few items that we have in terms of topics, and then we'll close out. Thanks again, Gavin, for that musical break. So the next topic we were going to begin with, we actually already hit on, which is, again, very true to gender cast fashion, <laughs> uh, out of orderness. But we had t entitled it, Can We Say That? Struggles with evolving and ever developing an analysis of language and harmful words, which Jesse kind of hit on uh, earlier in regards to how things change and mean significance and all of that stuff. Uh, and then the next one we were going to talk about is immigration as a queer issue. And I know personally, when I was in San Francisco, KUAV, the Community United Against Violence down there, they were the, probably one of the largest like organizational contingents at the Trans March, where they were centering immigration as a part of the trans movement immigration. Um, and I think it is so important to center those folks in general. So we'd, we'd have a larger conversation on what is the immigration policy, where are we at now, and how is that absolutely a part of our movement? And I think just to add to that, this whole sense of nationalism and what that means and what it means to like be American. And I think deconstructing just some of these ideas while also at the same time acknowledging we are a country of colonizers. I mean, our whole country is based on the colonization of native people. It's a complicated, very triggering, difficult issue to think about and just like we're sitting on native land right now, especially here in Seattle. So, I mean, that could warrant several conversations. The next thing we have listed is the co-opting of the LGBT movement, cultural appropriation, growing analysis, growing awareness. I think that um, we mentioned this with Macklemore. Um, the other thing I want to give a, a call out to is the Put a Rainbow on It video. We'll put a link to that, um, which actually touches on several areas where the LGBT movement has been appropriated. And I think even the lesbian and gay movement has been appropriated. We talked about how Macklemore sort of appropriated the lesbian and gay movement around equality, but I think there's a lots of other kinds of appropriation that happens that affects queer and trans people too. The rainbow flag is one area that I think sort of intersects a lot of those because it's been appropriated by so many different areas. And I think the whole idea of how Don't Ask, Don't Tell was repealed and it's sort of used as a way to sort of promote militarism because now it's okay to be gay in the military. I think that's a really important area to call out around appropriating like the rainbow flag and the, the gay movement. I think the other really important one that we have done an episode on is pinkwashing and apartheid, um, Israeli apartheid. You know, pro-Israeli thought is that they're so pro-gay and so supportive of gay folks and that makes it okay. They're the, this like progressive entity that makes it okay doing these horrible horrid things to palestinian people and the way that that all works so i'll just reference you back to the pink washing episode to learn more about that but i think that we could have more conversation around that and and probably have i mean i think matilda covered the military industrial complex really well but i think we could be talking more about that and we talked a lot about the military industrial complex in the workshop i did at philly trans health and i have a handout on that i can post a link to the other things I just thought of quickly too, as far as like appropriation and co-opting is like gender bending or like drag kings or drag queens and how that's coming more and more into like 
mainstream television as this fun thing to do. I know here in Seattle, as our kind of queer neighborhood is being regentified, you go to the queer clubs and it's all the bachelorette parties at the you know, dance parties and stuff like that. This kind of like, it's safe and we can take over and we like your music and whatever. As well as marriage and like now how we're being really marketed heavily on like these gay marriages to be now being hallmarked for us um, and really sold to us and packaged, which will then move on and do whatever else. And then I think about shows like The L Word, which is like these mainstream television shows without really a lot of like LGBTQ identified folks on that show and how that's making like mainstream America all of this money to kind of like think they're peeking into like queer life. It's complicated. The last couple things we have listed are um, reconciling radical politics with working with the government. Yeah. <laughs> this is something that I touched on in the workshop that I did too at Philly because I definitely feel like my job is connected to the prison industrial complex and Sean is interning now with the city of Seattle. And so this is something that I have no brilliant answers to. I think it's a constant everyday struggle. I think it comes from an ethic of both and that we can sort of function within it and, and try to reform and dismantle it at the same time and also work outside of it. I feel like the podcast and some of the organizing I do is outside of the government in my off time, but I also feel like I bring those values and those thoughts inside. And I feel like because of my positionality, I've been able to insert and influence and leverage my position to sort of push more of a radical way of things. I know that there's a lot of people that don't think that you can work inside of it and influence any kind of change and that, and that you can dismantle. I think there's lots of different thoughts and ideas out there, but I also, you know, it's complicated and we we live under these governments we live under these systems and we have to function and find a way to sort of like survive and hopefully even thrive while we're trying to do this work so it's complicated and i i also think that like to completely dismantle the prison industrial complex it's not going to happen tomorrow and there's people that are harmed and hurt and in crisis right now because of the prison industrial complex that need help and the programs that i manage for the government help them get out of jail and into treatment, however paternalistic and maybe harmful that treatment might be for some people. It's it's not in the jail. So I don't know. It, it feels complicated and even trying to think about it right now. I don't even necessarily know exactly how to talk about it. Um, it's something that I'm constantly struggling with. But I think if people have thoughts about systems that you work in that you also really want to like fundamentally resist, what does that look like and how how do we have that conversation and how do we go about that? Yeah, and I think that even talking about strategies, like how do we have folks inside and outside that are using different means like protesting and or this more radical organizing versus like training at work or whatever, right? Like what are we doing? How can we marry those movements together so that outside voices can be amplified using an inside filter and vice versa so that we're kind of bringing, you know, building a larger awareness that's working together in this way, albeit inside voices are obviously like quieter and slower to change but i think that there can be some alignment um and on a real level like if i think about building a mu building a movement like radical folks can talk about the stuff where they all agree on like these systems suck capitalism sucks we need to do something with the prison system we need to, you know we need all this this change and in, in this way it's like start from scratch let's do it over again but in order for there to be any people's movement we have to bring along a lot more is it the case that sometimes our inside voices allow for someone that has little to no analysis to come to a certain point that they have some, that they can at least start to hear the outside voices, right? So that we can collectively start to kind of like build the growing body of our movement. Um, so maybe we could talk about that and strategies and like we can look at that book, Radical Organizing in Radical Times, The Hillbilly Nationalist, Race, Rebels, and Black Power, that's on our website. Like that's a really great book that talks about all of these things and the difficulties to like sustaining long enduring movements with different needs and different communities at the table. The other last bullet item we have is sort of some analysis and discussion of the Trayvon case and not just the Trayvon case. I think a lot of cases that sort of fall along those lines, CC McDonald, Marissa, Alexander, Alexander um, and sort of what's happening around 
crime, violence, the prison industrial complex, the judicial system, the punishment system, the media, how all of these things are intertwined. I think that the Trayvon case is a really good example of how mainstream media is interfacing and being an arm of the prison industrial complex and the judicial system and how a lot of that is playing out in a really racist, really fundamentally racist, gross way. Black Girl Dangerous has written a, a couple really good articles about the Trayvon case. I mean, there's been tons of articles being passed around. Um, we'll post a couple that I think bring some good analysis. Um, Bell Hooks just wrote a statement about the Trayvon case about forgiving Zimmerman that I thought was really good. Kono West was on Democracy Now! and talked about kind of, he calls it, <laughs> the Obama plantation. So it's a little more radical analysis of how this president, while this president is a person of color, like really not speaking to the needs of that community and not addressing that. I mean, I think we're really talking about disproportionality and punishment, whether it be in schools, on the streets, or in prisons around racism, sexism, homophobia, transphobia, all of these things that are also linked to capitalism and corporate investment in a disciplinary system. So that wraps up our list of ideas. We will sort of try to distill this, I think, into about 10 bullet points that will maybe do a poll or some sort of survey. Um, and then the other thing I guess I'm thinking about, too, is as you're listening, who would you want to hear from or who might be accessible to us that we could sort of have these conversations with or have you could have these conversations with? Um, to bring on the show or to maybe reference articles or to sort of have a kind of a clearinghouse of where we can kind of gather some of this information. And I guess the last thing to listeners that we'd love feedback on, um, which, you know, we definitely get engaged by some folks, but I think that most folks probably just listen to this podcast and take the information and are not so much interactive with us online or in writing in. But one of the things we think about is accessibility and is it easier for this conversation to be like happening on eight different levels as far as what you guys are all saying out there and working with us versus kind of we're, we're messaging something and you guys are consuming it and either agreeing with it or not. But like, can there be more interaction? So we thought about utilizing a YouTube channel. I mean, there's so many different channels out there, especially for the trans community. Uh, maybe we can create a YouTube where we do short little check-ins with you guys, and then you guys can make response videos or whatever and have like a larger conversation if that seems to be more accessible. So it's one thing we're kind of thinking about, and we'd love for folks to contact us, whether either on Facebook or uh, email, and kind of let us, let us know if that's something you'd be interested in. And I just want to say we are approaching 28,000 downloads. I'm noticing about seven to eight hundred downloads every episode when we launch one so um and i really appreciated getting to hear from some of you at philly and people are writing in and again i'll just echo what sean said we love to hear from you and love it when you interact with us i have been seeing interaction a lot of interaction on the facebook page and and people weighing in on things and i think that that's been really great we we do a lot of posting on facebook pretty much daily i think we use that as our main medium so again, just want to say thank you for listening and coming across us and coming to the website and interacting with us. And I'm looking forward to um, teasing out some of these conversations. Thanks, folks. <laughs> so this is episode 39, signing out. Copyright 2013, Gendercast, our trans masculine gender query. All podcast content and information related to these podcasts are the property of GenderCast producers and may not be used without their written consent. Contact GenderCast at gmail.com for written permission. Oh,